All right, good evening. Thank you everyone for being here. This is our first in-person Together Facing Breast Cancer event in two, three years. So this is very exciting. Tonight kicks off our Fall Together Facing Cancer series. My name is Dr. Allison Agon. I am an Associate Professor of Surgical Oncology here at Fox Chase Cancer Center. Uh, and I'm so excited to be your moderator this evening. First, I'd like to take a moment to honor all of those that we have lost to cancer. So if we could just have a moment of silence. Thank you. Next, I'd like to thank our exhibitors for their support this evening. It's because of them we can offer this program for free. Our gold exhibitors are Karis, Exact Sciences, Foundation Medicine, Gardent, Natera, and Tempest. Our silver exhibitors are AstraZeneca, Elucent Technologies, Genentech, Gilead, Lilly, Novartis, Paxman USA, Puma Biotech, and CGen. We also want to give a big thank you to those advo advocacy groups for their partnership who are here with us today, Living Beyond Breast Cancer, the Susan G. Komen for the Cure, and Unite for Her. So thank you so, so much for your support. So this evening, we are so lucky to have eight faculty and staff members from Fox Chase Cancer Center present today to discuss exciting updates in their respective breast cancer related fields. I'd like to invite you all to use cards to write down your questions. Uh, and later on in the program, after everyone has presented, we'll have a great Q&A session. So first, if each of you could introduce yourselves and uh, tell us a few words about yourself. Starting with Lisa. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dr. Lisa Colazzo. I'm part of the uh, breast imaging team um, here at Fox Chase. Hi there, Kim Rainey, clinical genetics. I'm Dr. Austin Williams. I'm a breast cancer surgeon here at Fox Chase. I'm uh, Dr. Adam Walchak. I'm a plastic and reconstructive surgeon. Hi, I'm Dr. Penny Anderson. I'm a radish oncologist here at Fox Chase. I'm Dr. Melissa McShane. I'm a medical oncologist. Hi, I'm Dr. Andrea Porpelia. I'm a surgical oncologist as well as a program director for the survivorship program. And I'm Dr. Uh, Pamela Handelsman. I'm a health psychologist here. All right, well, Dr. Colazzo, if you wouldn't mind coming up. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Um, thanks again to the sponsors and um, everyone who's made this evening possible. Um, I was trying to decide what would be a pertinent topic, and I decided we would do a crash course in breast density. It's kind of one of those things that you hear the buzzword around a lot, and many uh, women, uh, when they get their letters for their mammograms, what their results are, you see that breast density, the little um, blurbs at the end, and no one ever totally tells you what that is all about. So that's what my purpose tonight, um, to let you know what that means uh, so that it might help you and your physician make decisions uh, regarding what your breast density is. So let me go to... Um, there we go. So beginning in 2014, that little blurb started appearing in the reports of women who were um, getting their mammograms in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania was the 13th state to do this, um, and I think we're up somewhere in the 20s of uh, states that have adopted these um, notification laws. Um, in Pennsylvania, uh, there was also a law passed in 2020 that um, insurance companies are uh, to pay or cover, I should say, um, breast MRI and ultrasound, which is frequently used for supplemental screening in women um, who have dense breast tissue and sometimes other additional uh, uh, risk factors that might be a family history or genetic predisposition. So what does it all mean? 
everybody's breast is made of a combination of uh, denser, thicker uh, tissue, uh, which causes uh, a white background on the mammogram, and um, volume that's added by proportions of fatty breast tissue. So we are all different proportions. We don't get much of a choice in it. A lot of it's just genetic. We may switch a little bit in between categories depending on our hormone status at different points in our lives. Sometimes changes in your weight can affect that. But we're pretty much, um, once we start getting mammograms, we're pretty much close to that category most of our life. So over on the far left are what we consider fatty, and you'll notice um, that in the non-dense breast, it's a lot of this gray. Um, as we go over to the right side, um, the breast tissue gets denser and denser. Um, so we divide people into four categories. This is considered fatty, scattered fibroglandular densities, heterogeneously dense, and extremely dense. About 10% of the population is on either end, and 40% is in each of these two categories. So we're along a continuum. So about half the population has dense breasts. So what does that matter? Well, from our point of view, um, as breast imagers, we've known about one effect, which is what we call masking. So again, if we line sort of the four densities of the breast tissue up, and now we're gonna introduce a finding so it might be a little, little mass or a little nodule in the breast tissue. It's the same finding on all four of these mammograms. And if you noticed over on the left, because we have a gray background, we can really see that finding. Over on the right, in the extremely dense breast tissue, you're really hard pressed to find that same exact finding. So we've known about this masking phenomenon, and the way I explain it to patients is the level of difficulty for reading a dense mammogram is higher than the level of difficulty for reading a non-dense or a fattier mammogram. So that's one reason to know that your radiologist may have a dip more difficult time seeing small things in a denser breast. What we didn't realize till more recently is there's also an intrinsic difference between women that have breast dense compared to women that have fattier or less dense breasts. And we don't know why that is. There's probably an increased risk of those women. Um, the problem also is most of the studies that have been done have compared the really dense breast tissues to the fatty dense breast tissue, fatty density breast tissues. So we don't know where we are, but it's probably about, if you have somebody with a dense breast, they probably have about a one and a half time increased risk of breast cancer compared to an average density woman. So, I just mentioned these things. These are important things for you to know how we do this. It is a little subjective when we're putting patients in these four categories. So you may flip-flop in between adjacent categories from mammogram to mammogram. And I would advise, have discussions with your doctor if you think that you're somebody that you would qualify for getting supplemental screening. It's not a knee jerk um, type of thing that if somebody has dense breasts, then they should get screening ultrasounds or they should automatically get an MRI every year on top of their mammogram. Have a discussion with your doctor to see what your risk is, how we can incorporate breast density into that and where they should, you know, where you should go for the future. So thank you very much. I'm going to hand the floor over to the next speaker. Hello there, Kim Rainey from Clinical Genetics. So our department coordinates genetic testing to answer the question, is it possible that there's an inherited risk for cancer in a particular family? Um, that sometimes can explain why a woman gets breast cancer, and it can also be helpful in planning your treatment, especially if women are trying to decide between, let's say, a lumpectomy, bilateral mastectomies, then the genetics can come into play for that. There are different types of genetic testing, and we hear a lot about it lately. There's 23andMe and Ancestry.com. Those are sort of recreational genetics. And then there's tumor genetics, which is looking at the actual uh, scrambled genes in a cancer cell to decide how best to treat it. But our job is to look for, to answer the question, what genes did you inherit at birth that might increase your risk for cancer? Um, I'll begin by saying that most breast cancer is not inherited. So only five to 10 women out of 100 with breast cancer will have an inherited high risk. The rest we sort of call sporadic. 
Um, we, we're more suspicious of a woman as young when she's diagnosed, if she has a triple negative breast cancer, uh, male breast cancer, lots of cancers in your family, or Jewish ancestry. All those things make us a little more suspicious that could, there could be an inherited risk. The big players in inherited breast cancers are the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. Um, they're sort of the ones with the, with the highest risks and the ones that we run into the most frequently. But there are other breast cancer genes as well that we can test for. Um, we all have these genes. They protect us from cancer. We get, they all come in pairs. We get one from our mothers and one from our dads. And if by chance we've inherited a flaw in one of those genes, a mutation we call it, then our, ch our cancer risks may be higher and we, we may be able to pass that risk on to our children. Um, in families that have a BRCA mutation, we, we often see, in addition to breast cancers, ovarian cancers, pancreatic, prostate, melanoma, male breast cancers. So those sometimes will alert your doctor to refer you to genetics. Um, the value of knowing about that is if in a family finds that they have one of these mutations, they can be um, really get better screening at younger ages and potentially do some prevention measures. An exciting new development that's really just starting is that they're, they're looking at vaccines for BRCA mutation carriers that can prevent cancer altogether. They're starting clinical trials for that. It's very exciting but, uh, and very new still, but not really quite ready for prime time. Also, they're looking at clinical trials um, for BRCA mutation carriers for the ovarian cancer risk to like, remove the tubes first, hang on to the ovaries for a little longer, uh, and then take the ovaries out later to prevent ovarian cancer. So they're, they're moving forward in some of these, some of these ways. When we identify a gene mutation in a family, then other families can do genetic testing to find out, hey, did I inherit this faulty gene with the risks, or did I dodge it? And then my risk is really more just like the average person. Um, genetic testing has really changed quite a bit over the years. The BRCA genes were first available for testing in the mid-1990s. And then in 2013, uh, the, pl the whole world kind of exploded with the Supreme Court case. And now we have availability of testing lots of genes at the same time. Um, some of our longtime breast cancer survivors have either had bracket testing sort of back in the day and, and are kind of ready maybe for some more newer, or maybe didn't sort of miss testing altogether because it was restricted by how much insurance would pay for it and all these things. So we encourage you, if you are a longtime survivor, maybe check in and see if you ever had genetic testing, if you have up-to-date testing, or if you'd want to do something more. Um, some women have a lot on their plates at time of diagnosis, and genetic testing is not something they're interested in. You can always circle back to that at any point in your life. I think we see sort of a greater interest when the first granddaughter comes along. Lots of women give us a call at that point. Um, let's see. If you had genetic testing with an expanded gene panel, and they didn't find anything, so if your testing was all negative, then we'd say you, then you can't pass any mutations onto your children because you have only good genes to pass on, but half their genes come from your partner. So it'll be important to look at the family history on both sides of the family. So a, a woman can inherit a breast cancer gene from her dad as well as from her mom. Um, with the advantages of technology, the cost is coming way down. So we have a whole rule book of when insurance will pay for genetic testing, and if by chance, your insurance company doesn't quite, you don't fit the picture and they don't want to pay, then it's um, more affordable these days. $250 is the out-of-pocket cost for genetic testing with a pretty large panel of genes. So definitely um, more, more available. Also with the better technology, uh, saliva is perfectly good. We used to need blood because we needed a lot of DNA, but now saliva works perfectly well. So both, both ways can get you a good result. Um, if you are interested, part of your genetics visit, we get a health history, and then we look at the family history and talk about what the genetic testing options are. And then um, if you decide you want to go forward with testing, then we get the sample, send it to the lab, and about three weeks later, we have results for you, and then we get back together, review the results, and give you recommendations for screening for you and your close family members. Making an appointment for genetics doesn't mean you have to do anything. You can just come and kind of listen and decide what you want to walk away and say, not interested, or you can move forward with testing. Um, we hope that to answer your questions and just let you ha have you choose whatever is best for you. In addition to genetic testing, our department also has high-risk clinics. So, so for people who carry gene mutations and they want extra screening and kind of somebody to have their back, we have clinics for helping with that. 
and also for people who come from families with lots of cancer, and we don't have an explanation for that. They're also good candidates for coming to our high-risk clinic where someone can keep a closer eye on them. Uh, your doctor can refer you, or you can call our department yourself and make an appointment, so we'd be happy to see you. Thank you. So good evening again, I'm Austin Williams. I'm a breast cancer surgeon here at Fox Chase. I'm going to be talking a little bit about sort of where we've been and, and where we are now uh, related to surgery uh, for patients with breast cancer. Uh, so I always sort of ask myself the question when I'm sort of tasked with this type of talk, sort of how did we get from here, which is an image of a patient from New England Journal of Medicine in 1950 who's had a radical mastectomy, to here, which is an image of a patient from 2021 who's had a nipple-sparing mastectomy with reconstruction. Completely different outcome uh, but in terms of cosmesis, but the same outcome in terms of their cancers. And so we'll talk a little bit about how, how we got there. I do just want to point out, though, the patient on the left there, not only has she had a radical mastectomy, which includes uh, removal of some of the chest wall muscles in addition to the breast tissue, but all of the lymph nodes uh, in the armpit on the same side. And you can see her arm on that left side is about three times larger than on the right. It's what we call lymphedema. The patient on the left has no signs of lymphedema. So what are the types of surgeries uh, that are available uh, to treat breast cancer? All of this really does depend on the type of breast cancer, the size of breast cancer, whether or not chemotherapy is given before surgery. Uh, but these are sort of the three buckets in which we can categorize breast cancer. First is a lumpectomy or a partial mastectomy, where we're able to remove the tumor with the surrounding rim of normal tissue. And that's typically followed by radiation therapy. And that provides equivalent outcomes in terms of whether that cancer is going to come back as the other options, which are mastectomy or removal of the whole breast. You can see in the very middle of the, the slide here, total mastectomy. This can be done either in a skin sparing uh, or non-skin sparing technique, whether or not uh, reconstruction is going to be uh, performed, and we'll hear about that in just a moment. And then more recent is the advent of nipple sparing mastectomy, where uh, in certain patients with favorable uh, cancers and favorable anatomy that are going to have excellent cosmesis, we can remove the breast and save the, the nipple and the areola with some pretty good uh, cosmetic outcomes. Now, the, the number of patients who can undergo partial mastectomy now is, is higher than it was previously with the advent of, of uh, mammography and screening. So before, patients came when they felt a mass in their breast, and, and oftentimes that necessitated mastectomy. And as we saw uh, in the earlier slide, all patients really had a mastectomy and all of their lymph nodes removed. Now with screening, we catch these cancers at their very small stage, and we can uh, do less surgery for the breast. You might also hear about uh, surgery for the lymph nodes for breast cancer as the first place that tumor cells are likely to, to move if they, are, if they are spreading outside of the primary tumor. Uh, on the left side of the screen, something called a sentinel node biopsy or sentinel lymphadenectomy. These are the first few lymph nodes in, in the armpit that are more likely to have cancer cells in them, if any do. And we have transitioned from removing all of the lymph nodes and causing a great number of patients to suffer from lymphedema to uh, performing the sentinel node biopsy in which we are able to identify those first few nodes. And the risk of lymphedema and nerve injury and, and other uh, morbidities is much lower uh, than it would be for removing all of the lymph nodes, which is called an axillary lymph node dissection on the right. At this point, we can also use chemotherapy before surgery in patients who have evidence of tumor cells in their lymph nodes who would normally have had an axillary lymph node dissection. If they have a great response after surgery, we can identify those lymph nodes uh, with a sentinel node biopsy and spare them the risk of having that lymphedema and the other complications after a lymph node dissection. 
Now, we've talked a little bit about how we're finding these cancers at a very small stage. You can't see or feel anything abnormal. So we as surgeons uh, don't know what to do unless that cancer is marked in some way. We used to place a wire in the cancer such that that was sticking outside of the breast on the day of surgery. We'd follow the wire to, to find where we're going. Here at Fox Chase, we're now using a system called the Elucent device in which a smart clip, and they come in sort of three different, quote, colors that we're able to identify in the operating room is placed in the breast prior to surgery, and that can happen days to weeks before surgery. It's about the size of a grain of rice, and then we use a special uh, a piece of equipment that's attached to our electrocautery that helps, us, helps guide us to where that uh, tumor is. It gives us X, Y, and Z coordinates in, in basically three dimensions to allow us to take less of the normal breast tissue and to really target uh, the, the cancer itself. And so in summary, the developments that we've had in, breast, in the approach to breast cancer and surgery are we have a tailored multidisciplinary approach, uh, maybe using chemotherapy before surgery depending on the, the cancer, using reconstruction uh, options uh, if a patient requires or uh, desires a mastectomy. We have improved cosmesis and the avoidance of side effects with doing less surgery uh, while maintaining safety and oncologic control. Thank you. Dr. Walchak, uh, following Dr. Williams, who gave a great presentation there on surgical management of cancer disease. I am the plastic and reconstructive side of this, and I like to tell patients that I'm the happy surgeon that gets to put you back together after hearing all of some of these sometimes, you know, scary and, um, uh, you know, nerve-wracking diagnoses and, and talks about uh, pretty aggressive surgery. We're able to really do as much or as little as you wish. And some of the advances that we've had most recently actually uh, in my line of work are most related to women who choose not to have reconstruction. And there's a new procedure out called the Goldilocks procedure that uh, I've been performing over the last six months here that I'm, I'm very satisfied with that is offered to women who initially elect not to have any what I would consider quote unquote formal reconstruction and just using essentially the leftover skin and tissue that would be uh, available to you after a mastectomy, we're able to create a much nicer appearance and uh, scar profile to the chest where it doesn't quite look like a large breast and it doesn't quite look like a flat chest and hence the Goldilocks name where it's sort of not too hot, not too cold right in the middle. Uh, but what it really does provide for patients is the ability to have reconstruction in the future if they wish, or to have a satisfactory uh, minimal reconstruction with minimal risk beyond the uh, initial mastectomy that they undergo. Contrast that with the patient that you see up here on the screen, and this is a patient of mine that I finished up a couple of hours ago here today at Fox Chase. She had microsurgical breast reconstruction, and that's really our specialty here at Fox Chase. Uh, this is a patient that was sent to me from Crozier Hospital from an outside institution, and she had had a mastectomy on the left side and radiation and chosen initially not to have reconstruction and then thought about this secondarily. And she came to me, and we decided to perform what's called a free flap surgery where we move blocks of tissue, and here in this case, a portion of her lower abdomen where the skin and fat are uh, dissected from the um, uh, abdominal wall musculature, and we... Uh, gently tease out the blood vessels going through the abdominal wall down into the groin and then bring that up onto the chest and uh, plug those into vessels that live behind the sternum. And so this is a typical picture preoperatively. This was on the operating room table and you can see I've marked out the flap there on the lower portion of the abdomen. As you'll note up on the left breast there, uh, there's a scar where you would typically see it from what's called a skin sparing mastectomy where the nipple is taken and then the skin and it's hard to project exactly here with the lights up but uh, the skin on the left side is darker, which you typically see after radiation changes, and that skin becomes a little firmer and a little thicker. And then if we contrast that with, uh, let's see if I can advance this here. This is the immediate post-operative picture on the operating room table. A fair amount of the mastectomy skin was removed, again, because she was a uh, radiation patient, and that skin's a lot 
thicker and tougher to really work with, and then the skin from the abdomen is used. And here we've given her uh, essentially what I like to tell patients, you know, a large lump of clay that we then graft onto the patient and use to shape and form the breast uh, into hopefully, you know, ideal match that's as close as we can get. Uh, this patient in particular is interested in nipple reconstruction, so we'll go on and have additional surgeries with that in about three to six months. And then usually for coloring, we can get tattooing for that. And uh, so this is, you know, probably the two extremes where we do very minimal surgery for reconstruction all the way up to very maximal surgery for reconstruction. And then we have everything in between as well. Uh, I would say that implant-based reconstruction is still the workhorse of what we do for most women. And an important adjunct to that is fat grafting. And uh, I'm working to get a, a newer type of fat grafting system here at Fox Chase, which I used in my training, which is uh, just a really nice way to sort of smooth out any lumps and bumps. And uh, frequently after large surgeries like this that take anywhere from 8 to 12 hours, once you heal after a, a three to six month period, those little nip tucks that may need to be done, and then we'll use fat grafting to sometimes smooth things or increase volume or uh, just make little touch-ups going on into the future. So uh, again, I'm, I'm blessed to, to be working with a strong team here and all the patients that come to seek care here at Fox Chase and excited to offer some of the advances that we have here and look forward to answering any of your questions. Hi, so I'm Penny Anderson. Can you hear me? Put this down. Um, I'm going to just talk a few minutes about advances in um, radiation therapy of breast cancer here at Fox Chase. So, so when we think of uh, breast cancer treatment, we want to know the impact that that particular treatment would have on our patients. So, for example, how effective the treatment is that we're delivering, as well as the toxicity and side effects that the treatment. Um, may produce both short-term and long-term. In other words, what are the side effects and how does that translate to the quality of life for our patients? And thirdly, we also want to talk about the duration of the treatment course itself. So in the past, uh, the course of breast radiation treatments has been typically six or six and a half weeks, maybe even seven weeks, as most people know traditionally. Um, that's every day, five days a week for six to seven weeks of treatment. But now there's lots of data over the last decade that has shown that we can deliver that course of radiation in a shorter period of time. Uh, that is, less number of treatments every day, thereby less weeks of treatment, which is obviously much more convenient for the patient and their families. So here at Fox Chase, we've implemented that a course of treatment. It's called hypofractionated radiation therapy. And in other words, it's less number of fractions, oh, I apologize, less number of fractions um, during that, the course of radiation treatments. And um, we, as well as other places, have actually shown that this shorter course is as effective, in other words, it does the job, as well as that longer, more traditional course of seven weeks of radiation. And it's also been shown that the side effect profile is the same. So in other words, by shortening the course, we're not increasing the side effects. It's actually the same or even better than that longer, more drawn out course of radiation. And this has greatly impacted our patients' lives and their quality of life with this new, um, newer treatment, and that's really become the quality, um, the new standard of care here at Fox Chase. But just as important as the effectiveness is the toxicity. So here we've also demonstrated that the radiation four-week course is no worse in toxicity than the longer course of radiation. So along with um, efficacy and the side effects, we also want to minimize toxicity to important organs. So for our left-sided breast cancer patients, your heart lies on the left side of your body. So our job, along with taking care of your cancer, is trying to avoid and minimize radiation to your heart. So here at Fox Chase, we have really sophisticated treatment planning systems and programs. I apologize. It has a mind of its own here tonight. Sorry. Um, we have a lot of treatment planning programs and systems that help us calculate and figure out the dose to the heart so we can minimize heart dose while delivering that dose that we need to the breast, chest wall, nodal areas to take care of someone's cancer. And that some people in the audience today might be familiar with this technique. It's called deep inspiration breath hold, or DIBH. And that's where we have patients take a deep breath in, and we take some images and some calculations, and we try and determine uh, what the dose is to the heart, and if by inspiring and taking that deep breath in, are we pulling the heart away from that radiation beam? And if it's deemed appropriate for that patient, they actually will receive their daily radiation treatments utilizing this breath hold technique, in which case they're holding their breath, but just during beam on time. This is a dip, uh, kind of a pictorial on the left. If you can see, the yellow represents the radiation beam. And on the left, it's a, someone in a free breathing position. So that little slice of red is actually a part of the volume of the heart that's in the radiation beam in that regular free breathing position. 
So when a patient takes a deep breath in the right side, you can see how that pulls the heart away from the chest wall and ribs, thereby that, that yellow radiation beam is now actually avoiding the heart. So for this particular patient, it was beneficial for them to, um, to have DIBH. So to assist us in doing DIBH, a lot of letters here I know, we have something called uh, Vision RT. So basically that's another fancy schmancy treatment planning uh, system that, think of it like a GPS. It basically lets us kind of do surface tracking so we can verify the patient position, making sure that the patient's in the accurate position, they're in, you know, everything's all lined up before we actually turn that radiation beam on so that we're accurately treating them. And this is a very busy slide, but it's basically just illustrating all the calculations, the coordinates, the imaging, everything that we do every day, five days a week during that course of treatment to ensure that our patients are being treated safely and accurately for their um, course of radiation treatment. So in summary, um, we really have taken great strides over the last five to seven years here in terms of improving our patient's quality of life, in terms of shortening the overall treatment time that we talked about, decreasing toxicity with the side effects, while at the same time being able to improve the local control and keeping our patients safe throughout their course of radiation treatments. So I'm happy to answer any questions afterwards. Thank you. Hello. Um, I'm Melissa McShane. I am one of the breast medical oncologists here at Fox Chase. Um, I could cover a lot, <laughs> but I only have a few minutes, so I'm going to try to tailor um, to kind of uh, hit various aspects of the care that I provide um, for patients from a medical oncology standpoint. Um, I'd say about 99.9% .9 of patients see a medical oncologist at some point in their breast cancer care. Um, and really, my role is a little bit different in that the treatment that I give is really dependent on the type of breast cancer that a patient has, but then also the stage of breast cancer that they have. And so my role in patients with early stage breast cancer, which is anywhere from a stage zero to a stage uh, three, really it's a discussion of what treatment is needed to decrease the risk of this breast cancer coming back. Um, and there's various treatments that we have as an option, and it really depends on the breast cancer type. My, my role in um, stage four breast cancer or metastatic breast cancer is really a shared discussion and a shared treatment plan with the patient in determining what treatment are we going to do that best um, supports the patient and what quality of life and what goals that they have. Um, the various treatments that I give uh, in medical oncology range from chemotherapy, endocrine therapy, or also known as hormone-based therapy, uh, immunotherapy, which we use in our triple negative breast cancer, and also HER2 directed therapy, which we use in HER2 positive breast cancer, which is a specific subtype of breast cancer. This is very important because um, the flavors of breast cancer are all dependent on these biomarkers or their hormone status or their HER2 status, and it determines what type of treatments we, we discuss or um, potentially give. There have been several advances over the last two years in medical oncology, and I wanted to take the time to pinpoint a few of those to highlight some of the recent advancements and then the ongoing advancements coming forward. There are different ways in which we give treatment. Um, there's something called neoadjuvant treatment, which is where we give treatment before a patient goes to surgery. One of the major advancements in this area um, is came from a, a trial called the Keynote 522 trial, um, which basically looked at triple negative breast cancer. And so what it did is it looked and saw that a little bit of higher risk triple negative breast cancers, if we gave chemotherapy before we went to surgery and we added immunotherapy, you may have seen commercials for it before, or pembrolizumab or Keytruda, if we gave that before we went to surgery, would patients do better? And what the trial found is that if we gave immunotherapy with chemotherapy, patients had a better chance of having their, their breast cancer go away at the time of surgery, something called a pathological complete response. What this found is that this, by adding pembrolizumab before we went to surgery, patients had a significantly better 
chance of having a pathological complete response. And the reason that was important is because we found that we know from other studies that patients tend to have a lower risk of their breast cancer coming back if we can achieve that at surgery. And so that has now become a standard of care or at least a discussion with the patient about do we include immunotherapy before you go to surgery with your chemotherapy? While acknowledging that comes with more risks, it's always a balance of the risks and benefits when we're having this discussion with patients. So that's a major development in the last two years in the neoadjuvant setting. In the adjuvant setting, which is a fancy word for after surgery, um, this is when we give a majority of our treatments in breast cancer. And one of the major advancements is in hormone-positive breast cancer. Um, there was a trial called the Monarch E trial that looked at patients with higher risk hormone-positive breast cancers. So these patients are HER2 negative, hormone-positive breast cancer, and they had higher risk disease, meaning they had more lymph nodes at the time of surgery that were positive, or they had a larger tumor, or they had a marker in their breast that is something called a key 67, but it's a marker of, you know, how aggressive does the breast cancer look under the microscope? What they found is that if you added a medication called a CDK4-6 inhibitor or um, something called Verzenio to their treatment with their hormone therapy, they found that women did better in that they had a lower risk of their breast cancer coming back as compared to if they didn't take this medication. This medication is given for two years. And again, this medication is in patients who had early stage disease that was hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative, that was a bit higher risk. And again, it's a discussion. Not all patients will get it. It's again a discussion of the risks and benefits about whether you would, um, you would benefit based on your type of breast cancer from taking these additional two years of therapy. So that was a major advancement in the adjuvant or after surgery setting. And then lastly, I wanted to talk about um, one of the, the biggest advancements in breast cancer um, in several years is something called the Destiny Breast 04 trial. So breast cancer, when it is stage four or metastatic, um, is no longer, um, the treatments that we use can sometimes be limited. And so, what this trial looked at is basically two things. Traditionally, breast cancer is HER2 positive or HER2 negative. And in early stage breast cancer, that's still the same. It's very black or white. It's HER2 positive or it's HER2 negative. But what this trial determined is that in metastatic patients who have something called HER2 low breast cancer. So this is breast cancer that HER2, which is a protein that sits on breast cancer cells, we have medications that go directly after that um, protein on the breast cancer cell and helps destroy that cell or kill the cancer. Um, that's why patients who have HER2-positive breast cancer get HER2-directed therapy, something called trastuzumab or pertuzumab, are medications we commonly use. But when breast cancer is metastatic, what we found is that if patients don't have that number to get to the HER2 positive, but they still have some of that HER2, that some of the medications actually work. Traditionally, these patients were not even were not given these medications, but there are advancements called in HER2 or trastuzumab deruxtecan, which is a specialized HER2 medication um, that found to be very effective in this patient in these patients, and so. At our um, American Society of Clinical Oncology, our, our national or international conference that we had in June, we found that women who had this HER2 low, who received this medication, not only lived longer, but had longer time frame for their cancer to come back. And so this opened the door for patients who are traditionally triple negative or who were HER2 negative to have a new option of treatment that they didn't have before. This extended patients' lives significantly. You know, patients were um, living upwards of three years compared to um, two and a half, or they would have, you know, 10 months on average that they would live compared to five months that they didn't get this medication and just got traditional therapy without it. 
So it was a major uh, advancement in medical oncology that just came out this past year. Looking at the time. So um, I'm running low on time. So I, uh, there are several advancements, obviously, that have happened in, in uh, the medical oncology standpoint of breast cancer. Um, and happy to take more questions after this. But that's just a few um, of the most recent advancements. Um, thank you. Hello again, I'm Andrea Porpelia, assistant professor here at uh, Fox Chase, I'm a surgeon. But tonight I wanna talk about, uh, we already heard from all our panel members and uh, survivorship and why it's important in our breast cancer patients. So um, it's estimated by 2030, there's gonna be over 22 million cancer survivors in the United States. That's a huge patient population. And how are we gonna take care of all these patients? Oncologists can't do it alone, primary care doctors can't do it alone. And there's gotta be ways that we can manage these patients and make sure they're taken care of. Now there's different, um, in survivorship clinic, uh, there's different ways, sort of buckets that we can um, need to address. The first one is dealing with their cancer recurrence. So one, we wanna make sure that you don't have your cancer coming back. So for breast, an example, we do clinical breast exams, we make sure you get your mammograms if needed, your MRIs if needed. Um, if you, we wanna make sure you don't have any metastatic disease, so if there's a new symptom, we'll work that up. So that's number one. Number two is that we want to make sure that you don't get a new cancer somewhere else. So a, um, like for colon cancer, we want to make sure you get your colonoscopies, see the dermatologist for skin cancers. We want to make sure that um, you see your gynecologist, et cetera. And then we also want to talk about risk reduction. So patients always ask, what can I do to prevent my cancer from coming back? We hear it all the time. And the, there's different lifestyle changes that we can make that will help improve that. So in these sessions, we can talk about in, um, increasing daily activity. Patients all the time, we don't expect you to run a marathon the next day. Uh, we get that, but there's little things that we can do. You know, maybe do some more chores around the house or walk up your stairs instead of um, just staying on the first floor. Go for a walk outside. Little steps you can take to improve your daily activity that will help decrease your weight. Um, then also diet. Uh, I hear this all the time. Can I have a glass of wine? Yes, you can have a glass of wine every once in a while, but you can't have three glasses of wine a night uh, or the entire bottle. So um, <laughs> small quantities, uh, every once in a while is okay. And then also with diet itself, um, we want to avoid highly processed foods, red meats, uh, et cetera. And so <clears throat> in these sessions, we can talk about risk reduction uh, with our patients. And then the third bucket uh, is the late-term side effects of what Dr. McShane and Dr. Anderson spoke of earlier, uh, as well as with surgery. So patient comes in, they've been on chemotherapy, and now their heart isn't functioning as it used to be. Well, we need to send you to see the cardi um, cardio-oncologist. Or my arm is swollen after my lymph node surgery. We need you to go see PT and lymphedema. And so a lot of our patients, even though they're years out, are still having side effects from their cancer treatment, and you can't just ignore that. And in our survivorship program, we're able to make sure that these needs are addressed and we get you to the resources and the people that you need to see. And then the last bucket, um, which you'll hear at the very end, is the psychosocial part of your cancer treatment. Fear of cancer recurrence is a very real thing. Um, we need to address it with our patients. Um, getting that mammogram every year, sometimes that's a trigger for patients, or their MRI, or just going to see the doctor coming in a fox chase at all, uh, is emotional for them. And so we uh, understand that, uh, and we want to make sure that we address that need. And then there's financial stressors, cancer, all those great medications that we talked about. Um, on top of all the doctor's appointments, the mammos, MRIs, it's a lot on patients. Um, they have to stop work. And so we get you to see our financial um, advisors if, we need, if you need to see them. And so with those four buckets in our survivorship, program, we're able, not every clinic addressed all of those, but at least most of them, and each time we see you back, we can make sure that everything is taken care of. And then what we've done at Fox Chase over the past year to really improve our program, so one thing is work with marketing. So now we've completely updated our website. Um, we have all our resources listed for our patients, and then links that will take you where you need to go. There's phone numbers that if you want to call and find out how do I get this resource that I need. Um, it's all on the website. We also have patient brochures, so us as doctors can also sit down and talk to our patients about survivorship, and you guys can have that information. And then we've also um, made it easier for referrals to these specialists. So if you have a problem, we know how to get you uh, to where you need to be and make sure that you actually make those appointments. 
So um, thank you for having me tonight. And if you have any questions, I look forward to answering them. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. I'm Dr. Handelsman. I'm a health psychologist here, which means I'm a clinical psychologist, but received extra training um, to work with people with medical conditions. Um, so where's the pointer here? OK. Um, so just a little bit about us and the psychiatry department here. We have a small but mighty team uh, led by Dr. Emmy Chen, our chief of psychiatry. Uh, we have two psychiatrists, one psych nurse practitioner, and myself, the psychologist. We will also have another psychologist joining us in the next few months. Um, you know, I'm really excited and grateful to be here and to be included because, um, you know, I like to think about the World Health Organization's definition of health, uh, which is not merely the absence of disease, but also a state of complete well-being. And besides the uh, cells that are within you, you are also human beings, and we want to care for the whole you. Um, so. Uh, <clears throat> that being said, what does that look like? Well, what's really common is that we know that 10% of people with cancer um, will develop an anxiety disorder or maybe even PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, from their cancer treatment. Um, we also know that about 10% will meet criteria for major depressive disorder. But what if we look at sub-threshold, people that have more anxiety and depression than is average or normal, but not quite meeting um, like a clinical diagnosis. Well, now we're looking at 50% of people with cancer having anxiety and 50% of people with cancer with uh, depression symptoms. And so it's really important to monitor yourself and care for yourself. Um, and so when do you want to see me? Well, uh, anytime. Um, if you look at the cancer care continuum, you'll see that psychosocial support is available to you at any time from diagnosis through treatment uh, and beyond. So. Um, so I just thought I'd give a little overview of, of typical trajectories uh, for distress. Um, so there are four main categories uh, for people with breast cancer. And unfortunately, the majority of this research is done in women with breast cancer. But I think we can extrapolate based on anecdotal that um, this is probably true for men as well and include other cancers, but this is the one that's been studied. Um, so we know that there are some people who are relatively resilient, they are taking it in stride, and yeah, they have good days and bad days, but they're going to be kind of like low distress throughout the cancer care continuum, they're throughout their treatment. Um, the majority of people are um, going to have a high level of distress at diagnosis and workup, uh, workup and diagnosis, and then um, as they get used to um, their, they get a plan, they get used to their team, they get into the routine, their anxiety will go down over time. So there's this initial spike and then it goes down. There are <clears throat> There are others who uh, start low, and really they're just sort of in survival mode, one foot in front of the other, let me just get to the next appointment, let me just get to the next treatment, and then when they finally take a breath, whenever that happens, um, maybe they have a week off from treatment and they finally breathe, and they say, oh my goodness, what happened to me? And I haven't processed any of it. So now we see this other trajectory where it starts low and then is high at the end. And then the fourth uh, trajectory is people that start high and they stay high throughout. And guess what? It's hard to predict who's going to be in which category, and it means nothing about you, regardless of what category you're in. Uh, that being said, it doesn't mean that you have to stay in that high distress state. We also know that anytime there's a change in your, tra in your uh, treatment plan, it's a time for high distress. Please feel free to come and refer yourself to me um, or us. Uh, and so what does that look like? Well, within the psychiatry department, um, 
for me, I'll start with me because I'm up here, but uh, there's psychotherapy. So this is just a small portion of what I offer. Um, we do some emotional support. We have really good empirically supported treatments for anxiety and for depression, um, where we'd meet more frequently and try and resolve some of your symptoms, talking about body image. I can help with uh, more existential concerns. What does my life stand for? Who am I now? Um, we have uh, adjustment to a new diagnosis or prognosis or disability um, and coping skills. And then also, as a health psychologist, you know, there are some um, physical symptoms that have a behavioral component to their uh, treatment. And I administer those too, specifically for pain and sleep. We've got good treatments for those um, that can help support those. Uh, although for sleep, I'll, I'll go off on a tangent just briefly, which is that... Um, Behavioral interventions are the first line treatment. Then we also offer medication management. We offer a bereavement group. Uh, and coming soon uh, in November, hopefully November 1st, but certainly by the end of November, we are partnering with Boyer School of Music at Temple, Maine, or Temple University, sorry, and um, offering some music wellness programming, which has been shown to have really good effects um, for overall well being and uh, even some nervous system responding. Um, and so, I want to, I would be remiss also, this is what's available through the Department of Psychiatry, but also we have a really good breast cancer support group, and that is offered through our social worker, Jen Keller, who um, I think deserves a special shout out because she is so, um, you know, integrated into these clinics. If you would like to get an appointment with us uh, in psychiatry, please ask your provider to make a referral. And that's it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So honored to work with all of you. This is great. Okay, so I think now it is question and answer time. Do we have our, do we have somebody with a microphone? Anyone in the back? Yeah, once, okay, we'll get there. We'll get there. Um, a couple of announcements while we're getting to that. Until we get there. <laughs> um, just a quick announcement. Um, we have two more Together Facing Cancer events coming up this fall. We have lung on November 1st and uh, pancreatic on November 15th. Um, and then one other announcement. Oop. And then uh, don't forget we have our annual survivor celebration at Lincoln Financial Field on November 19th. Um, there should be flyers out in the hallway, okay? So be sure to grab that. All right, we have our microphones. Please raise your hand if you have a question. I have a question for Dr. Colazzo. Could you please just review the names of those four categories of the breast, the density scale? Sure, um, you'll see them either listed as just A, B, C, D. A is fatty, B is scattered fibroglandular densities, so those make up the non-dense breast. C is heterogeneously dense, and then D is extremely dense. You're welcome. I'm a 32-year survivor. And when I hear all the treatments, I'm wondering why I'm here. <laughs> and the reconstruction that I went through was far harder than what they're having now. But I thank everybody at Fox Chase. It's a wonderful hospital. And the research and everything that's gone on is just spectacular. And that's what I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I have a question for Penny Anderson. Hi. 
<laughs> um, do you recommend any kind of um, iodine supplement after a radiation? Because I believe that radiation um, uh, depletes your iodine. You're saying iodine, right? Um, we don't. You might be thinking of there are certain radiation treatments directed toward the thyroid, which iodine, you actually swallow a pill, which wipes out the thyroid gland. And so later on, people might need thyroid medicine for that. But radiation to the breast area, um, there's no issue with the thyroid. We don't routinely supplement afterwards for radiation treatment. Good, at, good evening. Um, I'm a patient here. I have five years and I'm on the, I just made it to the survivor team. So I don't know who, who my team gonna be, so I need to talk to whoever at, before this is over with so I can find out who my new team is. Um, I was looking at, listening to the surgeon, um, that looks very scary and I'm painful and I'm very young. I think I'm the youngest one in here. And, um, and I need the therapy thing, too, because I was very angry, too, because um, it skipped my sisters and hit me. But I have, I thank God for backup. I have my other spouse here, and he's been very supportive. I gave him a hard way to go. And um, he's still here with me, and I thank God for him. I thank God, period. Um, I don't really associate with people. Um, he's helping me. Be able to like start talking to people because I stay to myself. So um, that's hard. So um, I'm kind of nervous. Um, We're glad you're here. I'm trying to start. Um, my therapist trying at Path is trying to get me to start coming to the support groups and stuff here, and the social worker here too. So I'm trying. So I'm gonna start trying to come to the first support group. Thank you. Briefly, just briefly, um, I just want to let you know, um, you know, there's a saying, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. <laughs> Keep going, try the next step, do the next right thing, and then the next right thing. So I just wanted to say, um, I have metastatic breast cancer and I'm three years out, and I feel great. When, thank you. Um, I'm a patient here, and I've taken their advice, um, and I'm still on treatment, but I work very hard with what I eat, and I try to exercise when I feel, when I feel up to it, but, um, to take care of ourselves gives us power and it gives us life. And in doing that, it's making me feel better. And at this point, three years out, I don't even want to, I just want to keep going. And I'm in God's hands. And um, I have a wonderful family. I have a, my friend here for support. I have two teenage boys at home, and I need to live. And I need to go on, and it's three years. People might say only three years, but at this point, I, f I feel great, and, and I'm a survivor. I have a question for Dr. Anderson. I'm actually one of your patients. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to ask you, um, with regard to my radiation was on the right side of my chest, and I had concerns about the heart and how it might be affected. Can I go to a regular um, cardiologist, or would you recommend that I see a cardiac oncologist? No, I, you can go to a regular cardiologist. So okay. there's really no right. Right. Okay. Because um, 
I mean, just for overall health as we women age or postmenopausal, I mean, there's increase for cardiac disease anyway, right? Radiation or not. So going to a regular cardiologist, letting them know your history, do let them know that it was right sided breast cancer, not near the heart, but still, you know, I don't know if you had any chemotherapy. Sometimes those agents can affect cardiotoxicity. So the whole combination makes sense to see a cardiologist. Okay. Thank you. Hi, uh, I have to thank Fox Chase. I had uh, lung cancer surgery in 2007. They saved my life. Then I had a double mastectomy in 2010. And the surgeon at the time, as I was coming out, I was half under, said, how do I feel? And I said, like a new man, because I had a double <laughs> mastectomy. <laughs> so you have to have a sense of humor. My question is, uh, I had reconstruction. Do I still have to go for a mammography? every couple years because there's some breast tissue, they said, left. And I mean, either of us can answer. I think it's yes. more a clinical. Yeah, so if you have uh, mastectomies, uh, um, bilateral, both breasts, you do yeah. not need mammograms. It's clinical breast exams at least once a year. If right. they notice anything, then you may need an ultrasound or an MRI. Ah. If you do have implants, depending on the type of implant, you may need MRIs every two to three years. I, I got the saline, the saline implant. Yeah, with, with, with saline implants, MRIs are not required, and we were actually stretching out the MRI uh, timeline. It's now every five years, okay, if thank that's you. a silicone implant. Thank you. Hi, my name is Norma, and I am a six-year survivor, and... My question is, I'm also a heart patient. I've had a double bypass and I've had five stents all on the left side. And my question is, I also have dense breasts. I get my mammogram every year. I still have pain. And I'm wondering if I should do mammograms more than once a year? The, the recommendation is a, a, a year is, is good. Um, I, that's what the standard is to be able to pick up. I mean, there's a lot of different advancements depending on breast density that I didn't go. I mean, 3D mammography is something that's helpful in a lot of women with um, heterogeneously dense breasts. It may not offer a lot in women with extremely dense breast tissue, but if you fell into that category, um, there are other ways that your doctor uh, can talk with you to supplement. And, and I know a, a lot of the um, doctors on this panel, and you can speak to this, use a method of sometimes balancing for people that are, have dense breasts that are high risk, may get their mammogram every year and may um, in between, get a yearly um, supplemental tool of screening. Typically, MRI is going to be the most sensitive. Um, so maybe in January, you get your mammogram, and in June, you get your MRI. Uh, but, but again, everybody's a little different, and everybody's risk factors. So if you know you have dense breast and you're concerned, it's a good discussion to have to see if those supplemental imaging tools might be helpful in your case. This is a question for Dr. Wolchak. Are silicone implants and saline implants discouraged now as a reconstructive surgery post uh, mastectomy? Uh, simple answer is no. Uh, they are still considered to be safe as far as we know. There have been advances in the manufacturing processes of the silicone implants mainly where they've changed the fill uh, density and it's not a liquid silicone or anything like that really. Uh, you know, there are some new concerns that have been raised about implants in general, whether they're for reconstruction or for augmentation purposes. And there have been extremely, extremely rare cases where you can develop a blood cancer or a squamous cell cancer from implants that have been brought up by the FDA and in the news. And we've actually known about this for several decades, uh, but it's just being studied in a little bit more detail. 
Uh, but suffice it to say, you know, I, I counsel my patients that implants are safe to use. For a silicone implant, they do require surveillance, and that's through usually yearly or uh, twice a year uh, physical exams, and then every five years an MRI to uh, check to make sure that there's no rupture of the silicone shell, and if there is, then we do recommend uh, removal of those. The manufacturers themselves say that implants should exist in the body for about 10 years, but that doesn't mean that at year 10 and one day they have to come out and they have to be exchanged. I've seen women that have had uh, implants in their bodies for 20, 30 years and have not had a problem with them, and so everybody is a little bit individual, uh, but again, just to say it in simple plain language, yes, I think they're safe. There are some concerns, and especially specifically for certain types of implants or certain types of patients, uh, but we still use them for the majority of individuals for breast reconstruction. Thank you. Hello, my question is for Dr. Anderson. Um, it's my understanding that there's a lot of residual side effects from different treatments that, that people have to go through with the cancer. Uh, it, it, it seems to me that uh, radiation has the stigma of having a lot of long-term uh, effects. And um, I wanted to ask the one in particular uh, for radiation when they, when they talk about how it affects the, uh, the, the bone loss or the bone structure, it's a little weaker after radiation. Um, is, is that just a, a one and done thing where it just weakens it right after treatment and it's at that weakened stage ongoing? or does it progressively keep worsening the, the bone structure, you know, so as you age and your bones age with the radiation, it just exasperates the, the damage that's been done? Well, that's a great question. Um, first, to address, radiation only affects where you're aiming it. A lot of people think when we radiate the breast, then they'll wake up and they'll have a hip problem or a headache or a, you know, hangnail, and they think it's from the radiation. So to be clear, so you're talking about the bone, so in the area of the breast radiation, you're talking about maybe some ribs, right? Minimal ribs. Um, older data, I don't know if I believe it, but older data talked about how the rib might get a little more what they might call brittle. The, the, ra the rib that might have been in the radiation field, if you fell down skiing or tripped over something in the parking lot and you crack a rib on the side with radiation, it will crack just like the side that didn't get radiation and it'll heal just like the side that didn't get radiation. So whether that rib cracked because there was radiation in that field, a little bit unknown, but it does not cause osteoporosis or bone loss or reabsorption of bone, and it's not something you have to worry about 10 or 20 years later. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, I know that Einstein has what's called the Solace mammogram, and I was wondering if Fox Chase was going to get that equipment to use. That they're curved paddles. Oh, I think um, okay. And it's funny, I, I, I have to say I wasn't familiar with it, I don't know that it's anything that's going to change the um, the accuracy of the mammogram. It's just physically more comfortable for more life. Yeah, yeah. I, I think they got it maybe five or six years ago, and um, I guess my understand my understanding is that there were possible concerns about distortion along some of the edges of the mammogram due to the paddle being curved. So it might be a little more comfortable, but there was question as to if it was going to be as accurate and therefore lead to more callback. So uh, I think most places have not adapted those curved paddles because of that. Hi, I just wanted to um, speak about Dr. Anderson. I was a patient of hers. And I meant to write a review, but I never got to it. <laughs> and I just want to say, she is the sweetest, kindest, most caring doctor ever. I mean, she, I can't say it enough. I tell everybody, I mean, she set me up with a perfect time for my radiation where I got to work like 10 minutes before, I was worried about that. For some reason, I was able to get fit into the first appointment. I didn't have to wait. I went in and went right to work. And she's just, she asked, always asked how I was. She gave me some in a lot of information. And she's just really, really a nice person. And I want to thank her again. And I'm coming on Tuesday. <laughs> I have an appointment on Tuesday. I'll see you next week. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, 
Hello, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't want to talk too loud. Um, my name is Jenny, and I am um, had a really stressful day. I'm really stressed out, and I think I am one of those people that probably is in the 50% that developed an anxiety disorder, so I may self-refer. Um, it took me about two hours to get here from work, but I, I just was like, I have to go, I have to go. And I'm so glad I did, even though I came in at the tail end. Um, I have to beg to differ with the, the last lady because my doctor, Dr. Porpelia, is the kindest. And the, <laughs> yeah, my breast surgeon, I call her my angel, and it's truth. I know she saved my life. I'm five and a half years out. As far as I know, I'm cancer free. And um, I have reached a point in my journey where most of the time I try to pretend like this never happened to me. And I think some of the sense of what I felt today was like I needed to be with people who get this and other survivors and you know I'm continuing to try to integrate the experience into my life but um, the anxiety for me I'm someone who tended to have depression and anxiety anyway that and I'm on tamoxifen has been very challenging so anyway um, thank you everybody for being here and Dr. Kapil is the best I want to give encouragement to the ladies because I'm a 27-year survivor. Thanks. Okay, so I, I had the whole, I had everything. Fast forward 27 years. Last year I got the pacemaker. I have AFib. I've had an ablation. I just had a watchman. So based on this conference, I'm thinking, hmm, is this because of my chemo and radiation, but I want to know why would it be important for me to know that, and if I did know that, what's the diff? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. so the short answer is we won't know the, what everything I showed tonight or things we know now. So I'm probably a little older than maybe some people at this table, and I've been doing this for like 27 years, and I can tell you 27 years ago when we did radiation, there were not these fancy schmancy bells and whistles and technology, and they didn't know to avoid the heart. So it very well could have been when someone radiated you, maybe it was me, I don't know, 20 some years ago, um, the heart, the technology to avoid heart or avoid lung or avoid rib might not have been there. So if someone did develop a toxicity, long-term chronic toxicity 20 or 30 years later, I don't think you'll ever know. The tricky thing about radiation is you can't really ever know if it's from the radiation because in this country, women postmenopausal, right, we develop the cardiac risks that men have, right, when we become postmenopausal. So those risks and, and, you know, issues that might cause cardiac disease in an older woman, they might have gotten even if they never had radiation. So it's, it's a little bit of a mystery to know if someone develops something. But you're right. If you had cardiotoxic agents years ago along with radiation, old technology, old treatment machines, who's to say maybe there was a component, but unfortunately there's no test to be able to determine was it that versus any other um, genetic factors, risk factors, lifestyle issues that, that you've been doing for the last couple decades. And to piggyback on that, it wouldn't affect how they would treat your heart conditions now. Right. It just puts you at a little bit of an increased risk. And so it's most important when you're having that discussion with your medical oncologist or your radiation oncologist, understanding those risks so that you're aware of them for the future knowing that you may be at a little bit increased risk, but that it wouldn't change, you know, what your cardiologist would do based on if that contributed in any way. Hi. Um, I've been at Fox Chase. As, let me pull this down so you can hear what I'm trying to say. I've been at Fox Chase as a patient since 1997. I was here for lymphomas. I like the Baskin-Robbins ice cream shop so much that I've come for four cancers. Breast cancer was my last one. And I have to say, the doctors here are the most phenomenal bunch of caring, considerate, empathetic, compassionate people, human beings that I've ever laid eyes on. And I guess that's why I keep coming back for more. And they're here for you. My docs aren't up there. I don't know where they are. They must be hiding out somewhere because they knew I was coming. But uh, Dr. Marsha Boras, 
did my surgery back in 2011, and I'm now with Dr. Incravati because I have lymphomas and melanoma and also breast cancer. So he's, I go to him for like two for one, you know, <laughs> and unfortunately, but I have to say that right now I'm dealing with, and Dr. Patel, and Dr. Patel has seen me through eight surgeries already for the breast cancer. I do things the hard way, but unfortunately, the docs are always there to see me through, and I tell them every time, just make me live. My boys were two and a half and five when I started the journey, my cancer journey back in 1992, and I went through lymphoma and bone marrow stem cell transplant. I'm still here to tell the tale, and I plan to be here at least for another 150 years. <laughs> And, uh, but the bottom line is that I have an issue with, since I've ha already had eight breast cancer surgeries and the reconstruction and so forth, I had bilateral mastectomy, my body doesn't work like the quote unquote normal person. I've had a lot of rheumatological issues and the body has a mind of its own. It's like an ornery kid that throws a lot of fits. And I was wondering if I could come to an um, plastic surgery doc, I'm sorry, chemo brain sets in, I'm lucky I know my first name and not yours. Um, if I could come to you and you could take a look and see if maybe, I think Dr. Patel has given up on trying to fix everything and make me beautiful again. If I could come to you and maybe you could take a look and see if maybe you can help and get this extra skin and everything in some semblance of order and I could come for a, a, a consult with you. Happy to see you. It's Dr. Walchak, and I work very closely with Samir. He's a, a good friend oh, of mine and my partner. And yeah, so, he's wonderful, but I think he's given up on me already. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we, we, we see patients sometimes back and forth like this, honestly, and so, you know, I'm happy to see you for uh, an opinion and uh, whatever works for you, of course. All right. One last question. My question is for the medical oncologist. Uh, I'm, pre I'm HER2 positive, and I'm on the anti-hormonal drug, lethrozole. I'm finding it's giving me a lot of leg cramps and muscle and joint pain. My doctor, I, I'm treated at the East Norton uh, Annex. Um, he wants to change my med, but I'm looking up the med he wants to put me on. It also has different side effects, so would it just be like, I've been on it a year, so should I just hang in there and stay with the drug or just try the other drug? No, that's a great question. Uh, majority of patients at some point in their course are going to be on uh, letrozole or a hormone-based regimen that you just described. And the number one side effect, other than hot flashes, is musculoskeletal mm -hmm. pain. It's very common, um, and it's what we battle with the most. Um, if you're still having symptoms after a year, I do counsel my patients on maybe trying on rotating to a different medication. The reason for that is yes, you'll read the, the side effect profile and it'll be exactly the same as the other medication. But what we see in clinical practice is that some patients just tolerate one better than the other. Um, and so I've had patients who have had symptoms to one and they go in the other and maybe they don't completely go away, but they're much better, their quality of life is better and it's not as severe. And so there's three different types of aromatase inhibitors, letrozole, anastrozole, and eczemestane. Um, and I rotate between the three of them. Sometimes I rotate someone to all three of them um, to find the right fit. And at the end of the day, you know, um, it's n some of these medications are going to come with symptoms, but it's really finding what is the, if we can find one that allows you to have the best quality of life with the most minimal symptoms. So yes, I definitely switch people. Um, because sometimes we do get uh, lucky and someone actually has less symptoms. Is it, and acupuncture is great for it as well, that is true. One more, just, he told one me to question. take it, I was taking it in the evening, he told me to take it in the morning to see if that would change, but it really didn't. So, <laughs> so I have to call him to tell him to change, but I'm like, on the, I was on the line, like, should I just hang in there? And are they gonna have any support group in the Norristown area? I mean, you talk about the panel, is yeah. there any look in the future of giving us support? Because I was treated during COVID, yeah. where I had to walk in that building by myself, and it was tough. Yeah. So we weren't given any, we weren't given a hand 
like I, I just felt like my treatment wasn't as strong as what the panel is talking, like the, no. the audience is talking about in the Norristown area. Yeah, I'm the surgeon who's over at the East Norton location, and uh, we currently do not have a support group. Our support group is virtual um, for that reason, because we have patients coming from two, three hours away. So if you are interested, um, let us know. There's the, the rec um, has the information for that. Um, we do want to get more resources at the East Norton location. That is uh, something we are working on. So I do hear you, and we are working on it. Okay, thank you. One more. Oh, um, I had a question for the um, doctor uh, about inheritance. Because I had cancer before my mom, and uh, I was wondering if I inherited it. I, that word. Um, yeah, inherited it. The cancer it will hers remain dormant. Good question. Do you, do you want to try? So what we think we understand is that you can inherit the risk through the genes from a parent potentially. Uh, if your parent has cancer, we don't. You can't really inherit that from your parent just the genes that could potentially put you at a higher risk for certain cancers. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes if we look at the whole family, we can see if there's some hint that there might be something that you could have inherited from one of your parents. So we, we do our best to give a look at the whole family and, and see if anything jumps out that looks suspicious. So that's all the time we have for this evening. Quickly, before I tell you how to leave, we have raffle tickets. We have three raffles. Get your tickets out. Okay. First number is 114497. 114497. There's a name on here, Chris. Oh, okay, next one. <laughs> one zero one three three four six. One zero one three three four six. All right, here's another one one four eight eight nine. One one four eight eight nine. Eight eight nine. One one four eight eight nine. Last call. How about one zero one three three eight seven? One zero one three six seven zero. All right. Great. You got them? All right, great. All right, if you if you parked in the Ryman parking lot, you're good to go. If you parked in the east or west garage, uh, let's all meet in the cafeteria and you guys will be escorted over because the doors are actually locked to get over there. Thank you so much for coming this evening. We'll see you next year.